Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to another uh, live stream of Let Us Reason. With me here, of course, our dear brother Jay Smith. And today we have a treat for you. We are going to do a quick overview of the number of dilemmas or you know serious issues that are facing the historical uh, you know story of Islam. Uh, the Qiblas, the Qira'at, the, the Quran, and even the coins issues. So I asked David, uh, I mean, I asked uh, Jay if he can join me today. Yeah, I'm thinking David, right? I asked uh, Jay to join me today, and maybe we can um, kind of like walk you through some of the videos that he has recently released and also some of the work that he and I are putting together. I want to welcome all of you, of course, for being here with us. Thank you for the moderators for taking the time to join us as well. Brother, thank you for taking the time to be here. Well, it's been great. Thanks for having me on. It's been a while since I've been with you. Uh, looks about a few months now, and this enormous amount has happened in this last few months. So why don't you tell us, brother, about uh, some of these? You mentioned five issues that uh, you've been focusing on, and uh, you and I have done a couple of those already, and looks like we'll be doing uh, another video series on the coins. But, but maybe you can give people, kind of like uh, throughout the show today, an overview of these serious issues that you've been dealing with. Yeah, and I think it's fascinating, Al-Fadi, they've all come up this year. Uh, this year, 2020, is, is a watershed year for us, those of us working in Islam. I know for most people watching, they'll remember 2020 because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, the COVID-19. Um, many people here in the United States will remember 2020 because of the upcoming elections that are ha going to happen next month. But for those of us working in Islam, we're going to remember this year for a completely different reason. And it has to do with the shutdown, the real eradication of the Quran. The, the preservation, the whole preservation debate has come into its own today. And I've never seen as much new material come to the fore, come into the public sphere in just this year as I have for the last 40 years that I've been working in Islam. And I've been doing this since, oh my goodness, since the 1980s. And that's why it's been fascinating to uh, unpack it and to really undergird it. And in the last few months, last two months especially, enormous amount of material. Well, even before that, let's back up to January of this year. In January of this year, I came across the coins. Now, it's not not it's not, it's not new. Al-Fadi, we've talked about coins before. We've uh, uh, You and I have had discussions before this year. I certainly, Hatun and I and uh, Beth, Grove, who's now Beth Paltola, we and I, she and I got up on the line and we talked about the coins at Speaker's Corner way back in 2015, 2016. But I didn't know what we now know today. And it was in uh, December, uh, almost a year ago, I was in London and I was uh, going through the British Museum with Hatun Tash and she wanted me to look at some coins. And she said, take a look at this one coin here that has been attributed to Mu'awiyah 661 and it has the Shahada on it. And I said, no, 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 you don't have a Shahada in 661. That was not, that was first introduced either by Ibn Zubair in 687 or by Abdul Malik in 692. That's, we know this. And I said, they've either attributed it wrong or they've got the wrong coin. So I went home and I started asking the numismatists and the numismatists, these are experts in, in coins. Uh, they are, there are many of them and I didn't know they existed. I didn't know all these guys and gals all around the world actually were collecting these coins and were looking at them. And I started putting a video, one video after another in January, February, March, as I came across their articles, I came across their material and I started realizing, wait a minute, we haven't looked at these coins before. We haven't looked at them, at them categorically and we haven't looked at them and asked what they're telling us. And when I started putting up this material, I started getting email after email from these many numismatists from around the world in France and Europe. And they were people who actually owned these coins and they had always known them as Islamic coins, but there's nothing Islamic about them. Not a thing Islamic about them. And so I said to these guys, I said, well, hold on a minute. What, what do you mean there's nothing Islamic about them? Help me here. You're the ones, the expert. You understand what the images are. Images right there, right away. Images. What are images doing on coins if they're Islamic? That's the first problem. And take a look and see whose images they are. And these are images, and these are from the dates that were where the rightly guided caliphs were in, in power. And they're from the same areas that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali reigned. And these are their coins. Except there's a big problem. There's no reference to them on the, any of these coins. There is no reference to anybody named Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali, we can't find any reference on any of the coins, and we can't find any reference to these four caliphs on any inscriptions. Now, hold on a minute. What? What? Stop and think, Al Fadi. What do you do? With, what are coins used for? Well, they're used for selling and buying. That means they get into everybody's hands, right? So when you come to power as right. a ruler, what's the first thing you do? You mint new 
coins. Because they did have radio, they didn't have television, they didn't have newspapers back then in the 7th century or any of the archaic world. None of that existed. So the only way you could announce yourself is to make sure that your image is on that coin and that with that image, you also then write your name and then you write who you are and where you're from and where that coin is minted. You put the name of the, of the mint and you also then delineate what religion you represent what faith you belong to. Hugely important. We don't do that today. So we have not even thought this through. So I said to these numismatists, what, our, what are you finding wrong? And they said, we keep on, we, we just can't understand these coins. I said, why can't you understand them? It's just because these are supposed to be Muslim coins. So there should be at least the Shahada on them. There should be some reference to Muhammad on them. There should be some reference to these caliphs on them. There should be some, there should not be any images on them. And there should be something to show that they are Islamic. Maybe the moon, maybe the star, maybe some image or some icon to show that they're Islamic. Nothing. I said, well, what are you finding on them? Now, I knew what the answer was. And they said, well, according to the tradition, I said, hold on a minute. According to what? According to the tradition, this is Abu Bakr who comes to power, and he lives, rules there in Medina, and then he dies, and, and then the, this is called the Islamic dance. I call this the Islamic dance. They started dancing the Islamic dance. They started saying everything that I expected them to say, because that's the only narrative we have. That's the only thing they've ever grown up with. That's the only thing I have. That's the only thing you have, Al-Fadi, and I've just lost your image. Did you go out? Did I lose you? Al-Fadi, are you there? No, I'm just using the fancy features of uh, StreamYard, uh, zooming oh, okay. on you and so things when, like that. When I go out, it's not that I've lost you. I thought maybe this was just too much for you or this is blowing your mind. Uh, but this is exactly the kind of reaction I got from these numismatists. They just blanked me out because that's the only narrative they have. They have only one narrative, and that's that Islamic tradition from the 9th and 10th century. And I said, have you ever looked on a timeline and looked and seen where Al-Buhari lived or when he died? Have you ever looked where Ibn Isham or al wakiri or Ab uh, Sahih Muslim or Ibn Daud or Ibn Tirmidhi or uh, Tabari or Zamakshari or Sumi? Have you looked on a timeline for any of these guys? Do you notice? They don't even begin to appear for 200 years. And you've been trusting them and you've been using their dance and you've been using their narrative on what's happening over here in the seventh century, two to 300 years earlier. I said, do away with it. Forget it. Now, just forget those tra traditions. They're too late and look and see where they come from. Bukhara from Bukhara. Where's Bukhara? That's in Uzbekistan. Tabari from Tabaristan. Where is that? That's in Iran, up in northern Iran, in, near the Caspian Sea. That's hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years distance. They never lived in Medina. They never lived in Mecca. And they certainly didn't live in the seventh century. So I said, just throw them away and now look at the coins again. Look at the coins and tell me what you see. And look at the coins and interpret what they're telling you. Because those coins are pristine. They do not deteriorate. They do not disintegrate. They, they're metal, for heaven's sakes. The ones over in the West, the ones over in the Syria and Lebanon, what is Syria and Lebanon today, those are all golden coins and they're all made out of copper. The ones over here in the East, in what used to be the Sassanid area, which is the Persian area, they're all in silver or tin. So these completely two different genre of coins, the mints where they come from are either in Syria or in what is today Iran. That's not in Mecca Medina, as we've noticed. This is all further north. But they're all being coined and they're being minted in 620, 630, 640, 650, 661. And then suddenly a whole new set of coins appear. But I said, take a look at these coins that are prior to 661, because that's Mu'awiyah. Forget about Mu'awiyah right now. Tell me what you see before Mu'awiyah. I mean, guess what they're showing me? They're showing me coins of images of, of leaders. They're not emperors. They're not caliphs. They don't use that word. But they are leaders, and they're Arab. These are all in Arabic. And instead of anything Islamic, they have crosses on the orbs, and they have crosses above their heads. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Wow. What wow. are they doing with crosses on their heads? Yeah, yeah. These yeah. are Christians. None of these guys are Muslims. Right. That's in the West. In the East, in the East, they have the Zoroastrian fire altar on the back. They're Zoroastrian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're Christian in the West and Zoroastrian in the East. Mu'awiyah then comes into power in 661, and he introduces his own coin. And he does have the image of Kusra, who is the great Sassanian king. And he, is, uh, and he also on the backside has the fire altar on his coins showing that he has nothing to do with islam he has nothing at all to do with uh with with what we should expect him because that's from six to and these continued to be introduced minted up until 680 now we're a good 60 years after muhammad has died already uh, abu bakar umar uthman and ali have been dead for well 
already 20 years. And it's only then in 687 that we get the first reference to anything Islamic. But it's not really, we, it's really done on a local level. It's not done on a hard level. The first coin that really starts, shows us an Islamic image, an Islamic reference is Abdul Malik in 692. And look at what happens when he introduces that coin. Go ahead. I see you have one thing to say. Yes, I just want to uh, unpack what you're saying. And by the way, I thank you for those of you who are giving through uh, Super Chat. Thank you, uh, Islam Critique. I agree with you. Um, you know, uh, Lord bless you. Thank you, PHP. Thank you also, uh, Philippian 210. So, brother, what you're saying is uh, your findings through coins also confirms the findings about Petra, the findings about the Qibla. Uh, what we are dealing with right now about historical, uh, you know, criticism of Islam, everything points to a late start, at least. Is that a fair well, It's not just the coins. Yeah. Listen, exactly. why don't we go to the rock inscriptions? Look at the rock inscriptions. See, no one's bothered to look at the rock inscriptions. And see, the rock inscriptions are written in Arabic. They're also almost entirely north of Medina. We can't find rock inscriptions south of Medina, which means there are no rock inscriptions from where Mecca, from the Hejaz, where there should be hundreds of them if there was a religion called Islam at this time, written in Arabic. Many of them do talk about all kinds of references to, to prayers and about taxes and whatnot. Look at the rock inscriptions and you'll notice there's about 40,000 of them that have now been deciphered. And they all come from the north again. Prior to 690, they're nothing more than formula. And the formula is the same thing we see on the protocols. And it is all mostly coming from northern, from Syria, and from what is today Jordan, where Petra is. What is fascinating, yeah. after 691, the rock inscriptions start to change. And then suddenly you're starting to see them proliferate down in the south. And they start proliferating about where the, the, the Hijaz is. But take a look and you will see. Now you get on the rock inscription, you get an introduction to this guy named Muhammad. Well, hold on a minute. We saw that Muhammad. Who is this Muhammad? Well, that Muhammad is introduced on the Dome of the Rock in 692. He's also introduced on the coins in 692 and 692. He's also introduced on the protocols. But take a look at every one of those references. And when you look at the references, even on the Dome of the Rock, it's not a person. It's the Blessed One. Murad from in Egypt, we, we did, a, we did a, a video on this about two months ago, where he says, take a look at those references on the Dome of the Rock and take a look at the four references for Muhammad on the Quran. And in almost every case, it's not a person. It's actually, uh, it's actually a reference to the Blessed One. This could even be Jesus Christ. What's interesting is, when does this Muhammad, when does this Shahada, when does the La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, when does that actually become a person? And when you look at the inscriptions, you can you can follow the inscription and you can see the e you can see the evolution where this takes place. This does not get introduced onto the rock inscription as a person that is actually in a place until around six twenty to six thirty. Sorry, seven twenty to seven thirty. So we're talking about a hundred years after Muhammad's death. What's most interesting is take a look and see what was going on in the seventh century, in the six hundreds when that was happening. Because we have now who Muhammad, we now know who Muhammad is. There is a Muhammad that did live in Hira. Where is Hira? Hira is what is today Kufa. Where is Kufa? Just southwest of Iraq. Look at his dates. He is important in 614. He then becomes even more important in 622. Because Heraclius uses him to take care, he's in, he's a Lachmid himself, he's from Tayaye, and his name is Ilyas ibn Kabisa. Ilyas ibn al Kabisa. That is his formal name. Lo and behold, his nickname is Muhammad, the Blessed One. The Blessed One. But he lives hundreds of miles further uh, north and a good hundred years different from the, yeah. well, sorry, let me put it this way. A good, well, since we don't have any reference, we can't find any Muhammad from the traditions at all. Have you noticed? All the Muhammads that we find from the, the Muhammad of the dish, tradition, we can't find any reference to him. Oh, no, 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 hold on. Right. People have said, yes, he is referred to, and Jacob Edessa refers to him. Parkea, Parkea refers to him. The Doctrine of Iacobi refers to him. Yes, they do. But take a look and see what that Muhammad is. That Muhammad they're talking about is the Muhammad of Hira. That Muhammad lives and goes and goes to Jerusalem. I don't recall Muhammad ever going to Jerusalem. He lives too far north and too much earlier, and he does not have anything to do with Mecca Medina. That he doesn't even come down to Mecca Medina. There is a Muhammad. He is a name. That person, but it's a nothing more than his nickname, the Blessed One. 
but he's known by that. What's fascinating, he is the one that then rebels in 622. Now, can you see why the year 622 is important? When Heraclius goes and destroys the Sassanians in 622, he then joins with them, joins with the Arabs. That starts that Arab identity that we've been looking for. That Arab identity begins in 622. Can you then understand why 622 was then chosen as the beginning of this Arab identity? But that and is Israel. nothing. Yeah, I mean, this is important because there's the Hijra and also Hira is connected to the cave, the cave in Mecca known as the cave of Hira, you know, so so these things cannot be a coincidence. I mean, it's just impossible for it to be a coincidence. I'm putting up a video tonight. It'll be up there uh, tomorrow for the rest of you. It's going to be it's actually a three hour lecture that I just did yesterday uh, to about uh, to about 60 to 70 people all over the world. Another 150 are watching it today. Uh, I'm putting it up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna edit it down because it's just too long. I'm editing it down just for the major stuff so that everybody can see it. We're now putting all this material together in one lecture, so you're gonna see it. I'm gonna talk about the sources. I'm gonna talk about the late. I'm gonna talk about the four canon, the four uh, the five canons, the five canons of Shadi Nasr. Take a look at Shadi Nasr. He talks about five canonizations of the Quran, and if you look at those five canonizations, he he puts them by day. I give names to each one of them. The first canon that he talks about is the canon of 652. Well, that's that's with one canon does it exist we can't find it it's nothing more than an archetype but the canons that we do find later of ibn mujahid here they are right here take a look at these nine right here these are nine of those kidat but only seven of these are chosen by ibn mujahid in 936 only seven are well, chosen by him in 936 so let's that's the second canon. the third canon then is the readers these are the two right here the readers these are two i don't have all the all the 30 yet i, I don't have the i'm sorry the 20 uh, the 20 of them yet i only have two of the 20 actually i have three of the 20. but those are not chosen by ibn mujahid you notice he did not choose the narrate the uh, the, uh, the transmitters the riwayat he didn't choose any of them who chose right. them his name is al shatibi Look at his date. Yeah, Ashaltabi is the one yeah. who chose him, and and that's that's interesting. Also, and what is his date? Uh, uh, well, that was later. Uh, I mean, uh, we're talking what, what the 13th yeah. century, I think. 1388, and that's why people need to look at this on a timeline. He is the one that chooses the 20 transmitter from the seven, only from the seven, not from the ten, only from the seven, and that's 1388. So where do we get the other nine? Because now we're up to 21, right? 21 different Qurans by 1388. Where do we get the other nine? Where do we get these? Uh, where do we get um, Abu Jafar and Yaqub and Khalaf and their transmitters? That comes from Al Jaziri. Jaziri does not does not put his together until 1429. That is the 15th century. So these 30 that I have here, these are the 30. They are the official 30. Here are the first 10, and these are their transmitters, 20 transmitters. All of this does not get put together until look at the date 1429 that is 800 years after muhammad and what i love about this almost all of these of these 30 only eight of them are from mecca and medina only eight of them would be Qureshi. the other 22 are all either Basran or they're kufan or they're damascus these are the three areas that are considered to be corrupt these are the ones that uthman had burned destroyed supposedly in 652 and yet the vast majority of them are from those very areas that are corrupted. Now, what about the man that was finally chosen? The one that's circled in black here. This guy right here. Where is he? I just lost him. This guy right here. This is Hafs. Where does he come from? He comes from Kufa. No. And he comes from, again, Kufa is where Hira is, is where the original Muhammad is. It is where also the Lakhmids are, and that's where that identity is, and that's where all the discussions are, because right around them are the Jews and the Christians. They're all in that area. They're having these discussions. Why do you think the Quran is full of discussions, discussion after discussion after discussion with the Jews and the Christian? Because they're surrounded by Jews and Christians. There are no Jews down in Medina. There has been no... Robert Hoyland says this in his book. They cannot find any evidence of any Jews that far south in the 7th century. All the Jews are up in the north. They're up in what is Hira. It is where the Quran was put together. Now can you understand why all these Kirat are start to appear from 736? That's the 8th century. That's 100 years after Muhammad. Here is the first one right here, Ibn Amir. His date is 736. He is the very beginning. Now, not this one here. This one is printed in the 21st century. I just got it in August. You can buy it as well. But his text 
The text that you see here comes from 100 years after Muhammad. When you ask any Muslim this question, where are these seven? What are these seven, these, these seven holy ones, these great seven, the one that I have here? Where is Nafi ibn Kathir? Or where are the seven that Muhammad knew about? They start repeating these seven right here. These are the seven they always talk about. Yasir Qadi always right. refers to Nafi ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ibn Amir, Asim, Hamza, and al Qasai. He always talks about those seven and that Muhammad knew about those seven because he got those, those from Jibril himself before he died in 632. And I say, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute. Look at those names. Not one of those names is from the 7th century. They only begin to appear in 736. And then they come in 738 and 770 and 785 up to 905, up to the 10th century. <laughs> I love it. Again, I, I want to just uh, uh, point out something to our uh, viewers right now. What Jay is talking about is that there is ample evidence right now that are so intriguing about discoveries that lead us north, north of Arabia, north of Mecca, things that are related to the history of Islam, things that point to a later start of such a religion, a later start of a, let's say, organized rituals, later start of naming uh, a founder, later start to having a fixed, uh, basically, Quran and so on and so forth. So, I mean, whether you agree or disagree, I hear people sometimes wonder about that or uh, have doubts about that. Then go and examine the evidence that we're sharing with you and you decide, is it a coincidence or is it something else that is going on? And that's what we're trying to at least find out. Tonight, I'm putting up this video. It's going to have uh, a whole PowerPoint of slide after slide. I want you to just look at this slide here. Just take a look at that. I can see, see if I got it right there. Can you see that slide there? Look at all the red dots and then look at the two green dots. The two green dots are what we know as the Hijaz. That is Mecca and Medina. That is where Islam supposedly was birthed. That's where Muhammad was born. That's where Muhammad lived until 622. That is where everything took place. We can't find any reference for anything uh, that early down that far south. Everything that we see about what Islam is today come from those red dots. And that's why I put this up here. Look at those red dots. Take a look at them. They're all in Syria. They're all in Iraq. They're all in Jordan. They're 100 to 1,200 miles further north. They're all too far north. We're going to blow this thing out. And now notice what I'm doing. And this is what you're doing as well, Al-Fadi. What we're saying is, instead of looking to the 9th and 10th century, let's look and see what happened in the 7th and 8th century. And what you're seeing that happening in the 7th century, everything that Islam is now dependent on, as far as the Qurans, as far as the Qira'ats, as far as the Arak inscriptions, as far as their places, as far as all these documentations, as far as these letters to Muhammad, the Ashtanami, the Constitution of Medina, all of those things take place up much too far north and much too far distant. And that's why it's so important that we start unpacking this. Now, everything I'm saying is based on evidence. I'm doing from evidence from the 7th and 8th century. I'm getting sick and tired of this Islamic dance. This Islamic dance that sits there and dances away and says, we know who Muhammad is. We know where the Quran is. And what they're doing, they're just repeating Al-Buhari. They're just repeating Sahih Muslim. They're just repeating uh, Al-Tabari. They're just repeating Ibn, Ibn Isham. That's all they're doing. They're just playing that dance again. That dance is no longer good. And for 25 years, I have been told this, the same recurring uh, criticism. Everything you're depending, everything you're talking about, Jay, is based on silence. You're talking about an argument from silence. Suddenly, we've now switched the table. And I'm saying, no, everything that I'm going to introduce has nothing to do with science, it has to do with evidence. Now, everything that the Muslims are telling me, everything that they're going to, the claims they're going to make about who Muhammad was, where he lived, how he died, how he moved up from one city to another, and the many about the thing, references about his wife and all the problems he had with the different people, and then finally, when he finally took over Mecca, uh, sorry, Medina, and then for the last eight years of his life, went on raid after raid. All this material, all this material has nothing to do with evidence on the ground. Everything the Muslims are now saying is based on silence. And we've just turned the tables in just this year. This has all happened in 2020. Can you see how much easier it is for us now? Because all we have to do is say two words, prove it, source it. Show me the source now where there's a man named Muhammad living in a place called Mecca who, create, who receives a Quran from 610 to, 670, uh, to 632, which was finalized in 652. Show me a complete Quran on one manuscript from the 7th century that comes from the time of Uthman that is exactly like the Quran I have today. Show me where this Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali are. Show me where this place called Mecca is. Show me where this Quran is at all. Show me where there is any reference to any of the major five things we're looking at. And the five things we're looking at are Muhammad, Mecca, 
the people call Muslims, the religion called Islam, and the book called the Quran. That's all we're asking. Show us any uh, evidence. Don't give us the Islamic dance anymore. We're tired of that Islamic dance. We don't look at the 9th century and 10th century. Show me any of these five things from the 7th century. That's all we're asking. And the 8th century. Don't have to go to the 9th and 10th century. Can you see how easy it is? Then it makes our job so much easier. Can you then understand why when Muhammad Hijab, back there on June 8th, asked a simple question to Yasser Qadi, I want, I'm the, we have 30 of these different Qurans. Show me what Quran existed in the 7th century. Show me what's the Quran that was revealed to Muhammad. Show me the Quran that Uthman canonized, that Qureshi dialect, and burn all the others. Which of the 29 did he burn, and which is the one that he, that he actually retained? And what was... What was Yasser Qadi's answer? Don't ask me this question. We don't talk about this in public. We have a we have a respect for the Quran. We have a red line beyond which we don't go, and that's one of those you don't ask. You don't ask the question, which is the original Quran. You don't ask which is the one that actually existed in heaven, that was revealed to Muhammad, that was canonized by Uthman, that with all the others were burned, and just this one was retained, that was sent to five different cities, and with a reader to go with each one of them. And those five cities are Yathrib, and also uh, Mecca, and also Basra, and Kufa, and Damascus. Don't ask me this question, because I cannot answer you. And in half an hour, he could not answer that question, until finally, at the end of half an hour, when he was asked the second time by Muhammad Hijab, what is the Quran you're going to put here? What is the one, that blank piece of paper? Tell me, which Quran is it? Is it Talud? Is it Warsh? Is it Hafs? Is it Ibn Kathir? Is it any of these nine? And his answer was, it's all of them. It's all of them. Without realizing that even between these two right here, just take a look at these two right here. This is the Warsh that's used in North Africa, and this is the Hafs that's used all over the rest of the world. Just between these two Qurans that I'm holding in my hand right now, there are 5,000 differences. 5,000 different words or phrases or sentences or ayahs. If there are 5,000 between these two, do you know how many we found between the others? We've looked at just 23 of them, and we've come up with 93,000 differences. Are, is Yasser Qadi saying that all these 93,000 differences are what's in heaven? Is he suggesting that? Has he even looked at one of them? Has he even looked at two of them or three of them? Has he looked at all 93,000 of them? See, Muslims have no idea what they're saying. They've never looked yep. at how idiotic this is, how stupid it sounds. And we're doing the work for them. And what we're finding is it has all been a lie. It's been a lie, not just for the last 10 years. This has been a lie for a thousand years. For a thousand years, they've had this problem. No wonder Yasser Qadi said, do not ask me this question. We do not talk about this in public. And then he gave three different grades of how you that what they do with people who come to Islam. The first people who come as, as, as brand new uh, converts, we don't even tell them about it. And those then who are a little bit more in Islam, we say, don't ask this question take my class and those who want to go deep remember he said the deep dive those who want to take the deep dive who come and take my class then we start talking about al jaziri and we talk about al shatabi and we talk about even uh, even uh, mujahid we talk about this but we don't ever come to any conclusion any more than he could not come to a conclusion in that 25 minute uh, exercise there at the end of an hour and 45 minute lecture or interview. And that's the problem. He had the same question thrown at him there at Yale University in 1995 when he went through a crisis of knowledge. He didn't call it a crisis of faith. The reason he called it a crisis of knowledge because he did not know how to answer this. And in 25 years, he still couldn't answer it. And after 25 minutes, he still couldn't answer it. So finally, he had to give up and say, they're all the Quran. Whoa, what an admission. <laughs> This is what's happening. The nails are now coming down. We're starting to pound the nails. And this is just the beginning. We're just now looking at the coins. We're just now looking at the inscriptions. We're now now looking at the documents. Now, uh, uh, Nasser, uh, um, Shadi Nasser is coming out next week with yet another book. And that one is looking at Ibn Mujahid. That's the second canonization. That's, right. That's coming out next week. Buy it. Everybody buy it. Absolutely. I'm on a waiting list. Uh, so uh, here is, uh, you know, some people are, are, are like trying to clarify um, you know, they're asking questions like, uh, did everything start in Kufa? Did everything start in Petra? I don't think that's what we're getting into. We're talking about evidence leads us north. There is something to be said about Petra. There is something to be uh, said about Kufa. Uh, I don't think Jay is trying to tell you definitively, I'm telling you it started in here or here. But 
we know for a fact. Let me clarify that real quickly. Let me yeah. clarify that real yeah. quickly. Go ahead. That's a common question. It's an understandable question. Yeah. The Petra material is all prior to Islam. Okay, understand that. So Petra is from the second century BC up until the seventh century AD. So everything that Dan Gibson is talking about has nothing to do with politics, has nothing to do with the Quran. The Quran is, or, and has nothing to do with Muhammad either. Petra has not only to do with the sanctuary. Where is the sanctuary? It is not even called Mecca at that time. Listen, where Mecca is, is actually from Ur. And look where Ur was in the 7th century. It's right up near Edessa. It's in southern Turkey. Mecca, the first Mecca, was up in southern Turkey. But that was not the sanctuary at that time. The sanctuary was in Petra. So let's don't confuse. You're talking about two different things. When you're talking about Petra, you need to make sure that you realize this has to do with the five stages of the Hajj. That's where the black stone is. And if you understand the black stone, you need to go to Alagabalus. You need to go to the Roman emperor, who actually was the one that, that had the black stone. You need to follow the trajectory of the black stone. I have yet to put that up there. That's going to be going up on Fander Films. But you need to look and see that Petra is only to do with the sanctuary. As far as Islam, remember, at that time, Islam did not exist. During that time, Islam did not exist. It was Everything that was happening politically was up in Damascus. But their sanctuary was Petra because it's Nabataean. Now stop and ask yourself, when the Quran was finally starting to put together, take a look and see the, the, where the Quran was put together. The Quran had to be put together somewhere in Jordan. Why? Look at the Arabic in the Quran. Look at all the Arabic. It does not, the Arabic in the Quran is not from the middle part of Arabia. The Arabic in the Quran, take a look at something like the Tad Marbuta. Look at the um, uh, Aleph Maksura. Look at the Aleph, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the word uh, Al El, the... Uh, the word el, the, the the word the in in, in Arabic that uh, is Lam. not alif yeah. lam the word el which is the definite article. All of those are unique. Ili in the Quran, those are unique to Nabataean Aramaic. This Al Jalad came out with in his seminal book that he wrote in two thousand in seventeen. Mark Dury came out uh, with it in just where is it here? I've got it here somewhere. Well, I can't find it at the moment. Uh, Mark Dewey came out with in his book. Here it is right here. The Quran and the Biblical Reflexes in 2018. You need to read this book. He goes through and shows you how all these end of the phrases, the uh, the uh, the, buta, the the ta sound at the end of the word, the 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 um, um, I'm sorry, Aleph Matsura, the, the, the little squiddy cue, the, like the S shape that's at the that's side. Right, all of the these end, are yeah. they're found. These are yeah. all found. That does not come from the central part of Arabia. The central part of Arabia used uh, Sabaic. Sabaic is from the Yemen, and therefore there was not that Arabic that far south. It all comes from the north. It's from the same place that Petra comes from, and that's why you, when you're looking at the the the, the whole kind of what's going on politically speaking, it was all over to the west, and it was over up in what is the, today Kufa and what is today Baghdad and what used to be Hira. That's where the political entity, and why is that? Because that is where the Abbasids came into power. And the Abbasids were the ones that created the Islam that we know today. And that's why you need to put this on a timeline. The Abbasids are the one that introduced Mecca in the south. They were the ones that formed along with Zubair and who had the black stone, who brought it down to the south in 687, flowed, fled from Petra, destroyed Petra, destroyed the Kaaba, came with the black stone, and wherever the black stone was, God's presence was, the pilgrimage started to follow the black stone. They started to follow them. And that's why then you then have uh, the Abbasids who take over the black stone. They set up Mecca. Take a look at Mecca today and look at the five stages of the, of the pilgrimage. And you'll see that every one of those five stages are first and foremost found in Petra and they make also they make more sense in Petra because if you look at something as simple as the Safa and Marwa hills the two mountains where Hagar was looking for water and she walks back and forth to look for water those mountains are not in Mecca they're just two rocks they're about 15 feet high they're nothing more than facsimiles the real mountains are in Petra the Kaaba is in Petra the Jamarat Tower is in Petra. All of these are in Petra, but they are have then been replaced and put and reproduced in a much smaller scale. Even the Kaaba is the wrong dimension. You can take a look and see. It's not the uh, Azimi talks about this in in the traditions when he looks and he gives the dimensions of the original Kaaba, and that is the Kaaba that you see in Petra. It is not the one that we see today in Mecca. So when the Abbasids come to power, it's a political uh, take. They finally could destroy the Umayyads. What's the first thing they do? They destroy all of the religion, then they destroy everything that we've now known about the Umayyads. Can you then understand why we don't hear anything from this about for the seventh century? Why is it it's all been lost? Why is it we have no reference to these caliphs? Why is it we have no reference to uh, Muhammad? Why is it we can't find any inscriptions that early? 
Take a look and see what the Abbasids did. They had to then recreate an entire new history. And what they needed to do is they needed to create the story around this man named Muhammad, who they had, then had chosen, who then certainly was the blessed one that was introduced by Muhammad uh, Abdul Malik in 690. They come in 749. So you're talking about 60 years later. They come and now start to bring a whole new narrative. And that narrative is up in the north. Remember, they're up in what is today Baghdad and Kufa, and what is the, at that time called Hira. And that's why Stesiphon's before that. And that's why you need to see what they're doing. They're now not only introducing their own prophet by that time, they're now giving him a story. And who's the first one to write that story? His name is Ibn Isaac. When does he write it? In 765. Notice we don't have his material. That's why right. has it all been destroyed? It was caught. Why it was does lost. not? What Most happened to his lost. setup? It wasn't lost. It was then redone in 833 by Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham throws out most of it because a lot of it is not historically correct. And he introduces a completely new Siddha. And the Siddha he introduced takes a little bit. Yes, he does say he takes a little bit from Ibn Ishaq. So you're talking about, well, Ibn Ishaq is 765. You're talking about Ibn Hisham 833. So you're talking about 70 years later, you have a completely new biography. That's how long it takes them to get that biography. al Kitty then follows it up. But still, they don't have the sayings. The sayings don't get to be introduced for another 40 years. And by the time the sayings are put together, take a look and see what they admit. They do admit this, that good old Al-Buhari was given 600,000 of these sayings, and he whittles them down, and brings them down to 6,797, or roughly 7,400. 98% he throws out. What is in that 98%? Well, that's all the historical material that we're looking for. That's the Umayyad period. They have completely redacted it back, put a new man in a new place with, at the well, actually the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time and also with the, with the wrong story. All of that is done by the Abbasids. So today you can pretty well say that the Abbasids created Islam as we know it. And the Abbasids were not in Mecca. They were not in Medina. Take a look and see where they were. They were all up in Baghdad. They were all up in Kufa. That's why all the Qurans are from Kufa. Have you noticed? Of the, the majority of the Irats all come out of Kufa. Either Damascus, Kufa, or Basra, and the three that the five, the five that come down of the thirty, the eight that come from Mecca and Medina, none of them are imported. The biggest ones, the best ones, and the ones who are the most authoritative are all from the what is today uh, uh, Iraq. It is really in Iraq uh, introduced uh, 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 creation. Right. Now, can you understand historically speaking? We can pretty well know the evolution. Now, I'm saying an awful lot in just ten minutes. I know I'm confusing an awful lot of people. Take a look at the video that's going up to, uh, tomorrow morning because you will see exactly as we start tracing this through, we're starting to put all the blocks in place. And while I'm using a lot of graphs, I'm using a lot of maps so you can follow the sequence of all of them. That will be up in just a few hours. And uh, uh, thank you again for everyone uh, who's been uh, following us here. Uh, thank you, Smidley, for your uh, super chat. You're asking me about my books, Smidley. Uh, I have my books in digital form. Uh, Lord willing, in the future, maybe I'll write one. So, brother, um, uh, you mentioned five lectures that you've been working on. Uh, how can people follow these lectures? Is it in the form of videos only? Do they have to register for that? Or did you were you talking about the five issues, basically? No, the five lectures I did with a select people, these are all people who, who, are, who were registered. They had to register with me. Those five are done. The, I just finished my last one yesterday. Every one of those five I now put up on the Fander Films. Four of them are up there now. I've done three on the Qibla, three ones on the Qibla. That's one, two, and three. So it's one A, one B, one C. Those are all right up on Fender Film. Then I put up another one on the coins. That one was done about four weeks ago. Then I put another one up on the Kirats. That was done three weeks ago. Or, yeah. Then I did another one on the manuscripts, all the manuscripts. So I, I call them the Q lecture because they start with the Qibla. Then they go to the coins. Then they go to the Kirats. Then they go to the Qurans. And then they finish with the quest, all starting with Q. Have you noticed they all start with Q? Okay, so I can't spell. So coins, I'm going to say coins sound like a Q. It should be. <laughs> so you have the four Qs up there, uh, five Qs up there. The fifth one will go up tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow, early tomorrow morning. So you'll see it when you get up there. They're all on Fander Films. You can, Anybody who wants them, they're long. Every one of them is about two hours long because there's an awful lot of material. But this is the first time where I've actually put things on graphs, where I put them on timelines, where I put them into maps. So you can visually see what we're saying. Because it all comes to a T. It's the same thing that you and I have been working on, Al-Fadi, for the last two years. It's all this material that I put it together in five lectures. 
And these are the five lectures I'll be doing every autumn. Every autumn we'll do another five lectures because next year there's going to be even more material. We're getting so much material that's coming down the pike. I thought 2020 was bad enough. Let's see what happens in 2021. So feel free to go up there. You can pull them down, share them with your friends. Uh, go up and make sure that you start to digest them. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. The nice thing about YouTube is you can comment at the bottom. And uh, let's go to the bottom and make your comments down there. And now the, the other thing that I'm working with, I'm working with some other scholars that are coming out of Ireland out of the Middle East and also out of Israel. Uh, and one of them is named Mel, who you know from Mel from Sneakers Corner. The other one is Morad. I can't show you his face. And the other new guy is from Joe. This guy is amazing, the mind that he has. And then another guy named Bala from India. So these guys are all over the world. They're coming onto our team. They're not all Christians, but what they are interested in is history. And they understand the ar archaic languages. And Murad, he speaks Aramaic, he speaks Arabic. He also is fluent in the archaic languages. We have Joe, who has had done his, spent his whole life working on his, the historical antecedents. Mel is a new one into the whole game. And then we have Bala out of India, who has been spending the last 20 years just on this historical material from the 7th and 8th century. So these guys, in some ways, are way ahead of me. The problem is they haven't stood back and looked at it from a, from, uh, from, uh, from a bigger perspective. They have just looked at things in minutiae, and they, like the numismatists that I saw earlier this year, they didn't know how to actually understand what they were seeing. They didn't actually know how to put it together, and that's where I'm helping them. And I'm saying, listen, let's just go and look and see what the evidence says. Forget about the Islamic dance. Just leave the Islamic. Let them keep dancing that. Let the Muslims keep dancing. Let's go back and look at the evidence. Let's look at these coins you're looking at. Let's look at these script inscriptions you're looking at. Let's look at these rock uh, drawings you're looking at. Let's look at the buildings. Let's look at the manuscripts. Let's look at the documents. Let's look and see what the history is that the evidence is on the ground. And that's from that evidence, now let's recreate the history. And by doing that, what they're doing is they're helping me to put it all together and actually come to some type of conclusion. Now, they are not willing to put their heads uh, like you are uh, uh, in public. Mel is. One, Mel is the only one that is, is putting his face in public. For the one, one reason is because this is very dangerous. This is dangerous material. And we are being called hate preachers. We're called Islamophobes. You name it. Uh, we've had all thing, kinds of things thrown at us. Look at what's happened Hatun in the last few weeks. And I can't tell you what's happening to Hatun right now. But this is a very dangerous job because Islam does not like to be questioned at this level. This is a level that they've never been questioned before. This is an area that they don't have answers for. That's why Yasser Qadi had to say what he said. Don't ask me this question. We don't talk about this in public. We do not at all bring this up in, in, a, in on, on camera. And that's why for those of us who are on camera, like you, Al-Fadi, like my, we've had this relationship, you and I now for over a year. We're going to continue to have this relationship. We are the ones that need to get it out to make sure that the public sees it, that the public hears it. And also to help them understand it. Because I found with the numismatists, I'm finding those with the rock inscriptions, they are reading it. They're brilliant. They understand it. They unpack it. They just don't know how to put it into a historical context. And the reason why is that everybody for so many years, for so many centuries, has not ever, has never, ever questioned these Islamic traditions. They never stopped and said, should we even trust them? They never stopped and said, are they too late? They never stopped and said, are they too far away? They have never actually said, should we not even use these Islamic traditions, all created by the Abbasids, starting in the from 749 on up until the 9th and the 10th century? Should we shot, should we even shut them down and look anew at everything? And from with it and look at them with what they're telling us. Let's look at the evidence on the ground. And isn't that the historical, isn't that the historical approach? Isn't that what we're asked to do, Al Fadi? Aren't we supposed to do exactly that? Did we not do that with the Bible? Did we not do that with the person of Jesus Christ? Did we not do that with the whole creation of Christianity? Rather than put our overlay from the the fourth, fifth, and sixth century, we went back to the first century and the second century and said, what was actually happening on the ground? Did Jesus actually exist? Did he was he born in Nazareth? What did he live in Bethlehem? Did he actually die on the cross? Did he rise again? Let's see what the evidence set shows us. And by following the evidence, we could see that almost everything the Bible said was correct. And that's why it was so good to be able to have these kind of criticisms thrown at us back in Germany in the 1800s. People like Wellhausen and the, to, uh, the schools there in Germany, like the Tübingen University, where they were asking us legitimate historical questions. We never called them hate preachers. We never censored them. We never said they could not speak. We never then give them death threats like Muslims are doing for us. We actually listened to what they were saying and it decimated the church and by 1905 the church was, was destroyed in Europe and has not really recovered but from then on from 1905 up until today in 2020 we have been able to find answers to every one of those criticisms and those criticisms were created 
really focused on the Bible. It's the Bible that has that, where we got redacted criticism came into its own. It's on the Bible that source criticism came into its own. It's really on the Bible that textual criticism came on, on, on its own. The Bible has hit, have been hit with every one of those criticisms. And for the last hundred years, because the Bible has gone through every one of those tests and has answered every one of those criticisms, we can trust it. We can trust who Jesus was. We can trust what he said. We can trust what he did. And we can also trust that he died and rose again. That Those same criticisms are concerning textual criticism of the Quran and the Hirat, considering redacted criticism and source criticism, looking at Muhammad, looking at Mecca, looking at all these artifacts that are now coming to floor. We're looking at these things using the same criticisms that were applied to the Bible that were birthed on and actually uh, matured on the Bible, and we're now applying it to Islam. And we're getting a lot of hate, and we're getting an awful lot of threats. And yes, we're even getting death threats. But you know, this is ex what, exactly what we're called to do. And that's why I'm saying to those of you who are on board with us, I know there's going to be a lot of people who will reject what we're saying. Many Muslims will probably be angry by what we're saying. Listen, we're not the problem. We're nothing more than the messengers. All we're asking you to do is sit, listen, and then respond. And do so in the comments at the bottom. And let's start this debate. And, um, you know, for those of you who are interested in some of the work that I did with uh, Dr. Jay Smith, you can go to uh, Sierra International, our YouTube channel, Sierra International. We did things about the Quran, uh, you know, the different uh, readings uh, of the Quran, basically. Uh, we did things about the corrections that were made to early Quranic manuscripts based on a book of a dear brother by the name of Dr. Daniel Allen Brubaker. And also recently we did another series on the Qira'at and we called it the Qira'at Conundrum, which will be released effective next week. And it will take a few weeks for that show. So I encourage all of you to go and watch it. Uh, if you want to see an interaction, of course, between me and him, he did an amazing uh, job. Of course, you can always go and watch his videos as well. I think you're going to need to watch both to be able to comprehend the big argument that is being discussed here. Now, you and I will be uh, are up for another trip soon here. Uh, we're going to be talking about coins, but uh, what else, uh, uh, you know, just for the sake of uh, the audience, are we going to revisit any of these previous uh, issues? Just kind of like we're going to be uh, we're going to be unpacking a lot of things. We're going to look at the Ashtanami letter, the Ashtanami letter that supposedly came from Muhammad. We're going to look at all the claims that Muslims have made to show that Mecca existed. We're going to go through each one of those and we're going to debunk debunk all five of them. There are five major claims for Mecca. We're going to debunk every one of them. We're going to look at the Constitution of Medina. We're going to unpack it and we're going to see where the Constitution of Medina actually was created and why it was created. We're looking. We're going to look at the doctrine of Iacobi. We're going to look at also the, the writings of Sabaeus. We're then going to also look and see who this Ilyas Ibn Kabisa is. And then we're going to look at the rightly guided caves. We're going to look at each one of those rightly guided caves, and we're going to say, what do we know about each one of them? Did they exist? What does the evidence show? And then we're going to move into the rock inscriptions. We, we want to move into rock inscriptions because the rock inscriptions are probably as devastating as the coins. The coins are devastating enough. The rock inscriptions are even more devastating because they are basically, uh, they are a, a history book or a journal of what exactly happens in the middle of the 7th century up into the la latter part of the 7th century, moving into the 8th century and up into the latter part of the 8th century when the Abbasids come over. And you can just follow the rock inscriptions and you can see the evolution evolution of Islam just by looking at the rock inscriptions. We're also going to talk about the Hijrah. We'll talk about the 741 inscription that, that, that uh, Patricia Corona looked at and she got it. She only read half the inscription. She didn't read the rest of the inscription. She should have read the whole inscription and we're going to show you why when that comes up. And then we're going to also look at and ask some questions, some new, brand new questions that have come up about Petra. But just so people don't get confused, when you're talking about Petra and we're talking about Iraq, we're talking about two different parts. One Petra in the west, uh, Iraq in the east. And what's happening in Iraq is actually more devastating than what happened in Petra. Petra, you know, what Dan Gibson came up, showed that there was no notion of any sanctuary at all in the south. There was nothing in the south, at least until 727. From 727, then we move over to the east, because that's where the Abbasids start to start playing and start getting into ascendancy. And they finally then come, 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 come into full ascendancy by 749. And from 749, Islam starts to form. And that's why we then move from Petra and move over into Iraq. And that's why you need to separate the two. We're talking about two different entities. It's like apples and oranges. But this, we'll be, you and I will be doing this. So we'll be doing, uh, going down to your 
studio and then at your studio we'll be recording all of this and then putting it up and we will have lots of graphs lots of timelines and lots of maps so you can all see what we're doing because for me just talking to you right now it's probably going over most people's head because they need to have a map yeah, yeah, no. they need to have their timeline in front of them to see what i'm talking about and that's why i like to do the live stream kind of like uh just a uh an abridged version of all of that kind of a summary of things allowing people to ask questions in the remaining about we have about uh 10 minutes left folks if you have any questions for us please feel free to ask them here and i want to also uh i mentioned this before and i'll be doing uh some serious promo effective next week i've invited uh, dr jay smith and david wood to for an online conference that i am putting together it will be on Saturday, November 7th. Saturday, November 7th. I'll announce it on our uh, platforms, uh, social media platforms on Facebook. I'll do a video on YouTube. I'll do a, a live stream on that. So please come and join us because these are amazing brothers in the Lord. And we'll be doing also, after they both teach their uh, sessions, we're going to do a panel discussion where you get to also ask questions as well. I'll be also giving link for people to register. The cost is very, 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 very low. I wanted to make sure that we do not hinder people from registering uh, over cost because there's a lot of options out there. We're, it's not about that for us. It's about the knowledge getting out there. And then I'm doing another one, by the way, uh, on prophecy uh, in times and Islam, how Islam fits you know, in all of that. Again, it's an attempt to try to make sense of some of the developments that are taking place. Uh, in no way we're saying this is exactly how it is, but the signs are really uh, uh, intriguing. And uh, I'm also going to be uh, in the studios in about two weeks from now with Joel Richardson. And we will be doing, uh, believe it or not, a series on the fact that Mount Sinai exists in the northern part of Saudi Arabia, not necessarily at the traditional location in the Sinai Peninsula. So we'll be doing uh, videos on that, and I'll have Joel with me to do some live streams. It will be the week of October 26 to 28. So there's a lot of exciting things that are um, up and coming. Anything on your part, uh, brother, about conferences and things like that that you would like for people to know about also? No, there's going to be some brand new material that's coming out next week with Mel and Mel and Joe. Hold on, wait to see what is now come out. I'm not going to. I'm not really. There is an echo yet. coming. I don't, I don't know why. There is an echo, unfortunately, coming. Maybe you have to. Maybe maybe your maybe your viewer or I have to cross signs. When you put there, now there, now you get the echo. Is that better? Is that better? No, no, it's still. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. No problem. Has that been going on the whole live stream? It's 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 getting it's getting worse actually. I don't know why. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, here, let me turn myself off. off. If I turn, if I turn myself, myself off, off, then I can, I can, I can speak. Can I? Speak, can I? Um, um, what if you take the uh, the uh, headset uh, for now? Just uh, we have about a few minutes left only. So. There you go. Wow. This is this is serious stuff here, Jay. This is serious stuff. <laughs> Okay, now is that better? Absolutely, man. Uh, I like the way you look with this now. So that's amazing. <laughs> my uh, good, uh, my Mickey Mouse ears. Uh, yeah. So you were, you were saying I, I was asking if there is any activities, anything you want people to be aware of. Feel free, brother, to announce it if you like. Of course. Yes. Uh, let me just say that we're gonna we're ha and this is not this is not for everybody. So I don't want to announce this across the air right now. This is just for those working in Islam, for those Christians. We have a big conference coming up uh, in November 13, 14, and 15 in California. But it's not for Muslims, so it's not ours. It's not for atheists. It's only for Christians who are interested in engaging with Islam. And that will be David Wood and myself uh, who will be there. Are you going to be there, Al Qaeda? I don't know if you're going to be at that as well. Uh, I'm trying to finalize my presence there, but uh, I'll be participating one way or another. And I think Anthony Rogers will be doing the debate with Sheikh Ali there at that conference. So that's 13, 14, 15. Yes, uh, people are not, uh, are not able to hear you again. Uh, what he says is that Anthony Rogers and Shabir Ali will be debating as well. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad this uh, voice thing happened towards the end. At least uh, we get to enjoy uh, you know, your session here. Uh, I did not see really any specific questions, uh, just a lot of wonderful comments here. Everybody loves you, and uh, as they should. Uh, you're doing an amazing work, brother, for the Lord, and uh, we're so thankful to be partners here. Uh, everybody compliment us on the videos that we've been doing together, and I'm excited that, that people are paying attention to this uh, amazing, groundbreaking information. Again, I want to emphasize, uh, Jay acknowledges, I acknowledge that, you know, as we continue to discover things, 
you know, the narrative might shift a little bit, but it's not a coincidence that everything so far has been leading north. Uh, I mean, it will take a really a, a real miracle uh, for, for us to find something that leads south as the origin. We're not talking that there is no Islam in the south, but we're saying where did it start? And uh, unfortunately, so far, I am personally not convinced that it started at south based on everything that I am coming across, whether, you know, through Jay or others. Two things, two things, north and late. Yes, it comes uh, after 749. The Islam that we're talking about today did not exist prior to 749. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, brother, as always, uh, for being here with us. Uh, we love you all. Tomorrow, I'm going to have an amazing testimony by uh, a former Muslim in the UK, who, by the way, uh, thought he was a Christian, converted to Islam, discovered that it was a terrible mistake and left Islam and came mm -hmm. back to the Lord. So you're going to hear his amazing journey to Christ, which is, I love those kind of stories. Well, with that says, brother, thank you so much. Thank you to the moderators. Thank you for everyone who's been here with us. Thank you for those who gave through Super Chat. We are blessed by that. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you, maybe even all of you tomorrow. And uh, stay tuned for more developments. I'll be announcing about the conference that I mentioned to you, which is November 7th, when I'm going to have Dr. Jay Smith and David Wood with us. Thank you so much. This is Al-Fadi. And uh, I want to say over and out, but uh, Jay is here, so I won't be able to. Well, over and out, over and out, over and out. Thank you. God bless. Take care, guys.